Donald S. Thomas graduated from Towson State College in 1967 with a bachelor's degree in history with secondary education preparation. Dr. Thomas worked in public education as a teacher and administrator for 33 years. He came to Towson State University in 2001 and serves as associate director of the Center for Leadership in Education. These are his reflections. Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for taking your time and sharing with you your professional autobiography, your preparation at Towson University, and your subsequent career in education. Mm -hmm. I think this will add significantly to our understanding of the evolution of teacher education at Towson across time. And I think a good place to begin is in the beginning. So would you share with us a little bit about your early social context, where you grew up, what you were thinking about in terms of what you wanted to be when you grew up as you were going through school? Well, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I'm a native of Baltimore. I grew up in South Baltimore before it became gentrified <laughs> and uh, uh, high end. It was a very working class community. My father worked at the shipyard. He walked to work every day about four blocks to the Key Highway shipyard. Uh, my mother worked in various jobs over the years, but basically was a homemaker. Mm -hmm. I was an only child, uh -huh. and um, I guess the first um, experience outside of South Baltimore, I went to elementary school in South Baltimore, but in, in junior high school, I was uh, enrolled in 49. Uh, uh -huh. PS 49 was an accelerated program uh -huh. for junior high school students. I basically completed the three years of junior high in two. Uh -huh. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a contact I made there that really is a continuing contact throughout my career. Um, so uh, I was uh, attended uh, School 49 and then went to Poly, uh -huh. Poly, uh, really not doing well, particularly well in the subjects that Poly specialized in. Oh. But like a lot of junior high school kids, my friends went to Poly, so I went to Poly. <laughs> I really didn't do well in the technical subjects. I was much better in social studies and English and uh -huh. economics and those kinds of subjects. Uh -huh. So. Um, after Polly, I uh, decided uh, somewhere along the way to come to Towson in, as an undergraduate. I don't know that I can identify any key moment in time that, set, that really convinced me that I would be a teacher. Uh -huh. um, perhaps it was because Towson offered a, a free college education, essentially, if, if, you, if you agreed to teach two years right. in Maryland. The, right. the tuition was free, you paid for books. I was a day hop. So uh -huh. it was a very low-cost college education. Absolutely. Uh, and, and probably the only way that I would have had a college education because my parents really didn't have the money to send me anyplace else. I had to stay at home. Um, mm -hmm. And it was close enough, certainly, to, to do that. Sure. Uh, so it really enabled me to, uh, among my friends, probably be the only uh, college graduate in that community and the mm. people that I knew. Mm. Most of them just went from high school into, into jobs of various kinds. But, sure. So I had a couple of friends that uh, lived in the area that we carpooled uh, oh, out to Towson okay. every day. Uh, my parents didn't have a car uh -huh. until my freshman year here at Towson. Mm. And then they realized, I guess, they have to get a car and let you use it at least occasionally. <laughs> so it was a mixture of um, taking the bus. Uh -huh. Actually, for the first couple of months, the streetcar still operated on York Road. Mm. It changed to a bus within the first couple of months of my attending Interesting. Towson. And um, so the combination of the bus, the carpool, and driving, that was a daily occurrence, back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Um, so as you were getting ready to come here, you really hadn't committed to the idea of being a teacher? Well, I guess I had, but it was kind of implicit in, in agreeing to come to Towson and agreeing right. to the, the waiver for the tuition. Sure. And you were expected to teach. and. Yes. So um, I guess, you know, again, at some point I, I decided that teaching would be something that I would uh, do well in, that I would enjoy. Uh -huh. um, I mentioned that I met uh, a teacher, if, if any single teacher could be said to be responsible, perhaps at least for my decision, it was a, a junior high school uh, social studies teacher okay. that I met at 49. Uh -huh. um, we just had lunch a couple of weeks ago and really? we were reminiscing that except for a Sunday school teacher uh, that still knows me and still attends my church, who also was a Towson graduate, uh -huh. um, he probably has known me the longest because we met when I was a junior high school student. Uh -huh. He turned into my s critic teacher. Uh -huh. That was the name of supervising teachers or, or, uh -huh. or mentors at that uh -huh. time. 
which is an interesting term. It, it is. A critic teacher. He was my critic teacher when I student taught. I went back to teach at the same school where I student taught. Wow. And he was promoted that year to become my department chair. Mm. So we maintained contact for a while. He eventually, I moved on to other schools. He mm. stayed at that school his whole career, mm. except for that one year at 49. Yeah. And um, we still, had, still get together occasionally. We had lunch a couple of weeks ago. Wonderful. And that's sort of the Towson story. Yeah. So you get here, mm -hmm. and your life is a little different because you are a commuter. Mm -hmm. um, what do you remember about the experience in terms of um, professors you had or um, events that took mm -hmm. place or um, organizations that you got involved sure. in? Um, as a freshman, uh, I decided that, I guess history was going to be my major, uh -huh. so I started taking history courses. Obviously, the first couple of courses are required, those days were required. Mm -hmm. American history was a required course. Uh, Dr. Hudson was a teacher that I remember in American history. I guess my favorite professor was um, Professor of Western Civ, Arnold Blumberg. Mm -hmm. um, every professor lectured. That's what they did. Of course. I really don't remember much interaction at all. But uh, as a lecturer, Dr. Blumberg was very engaging, very dynamic, and was fun to listen to. Of course, scribbling, scribbling down the whole time, everything <laughs> he said, wondering how much of this I'm going to have to uh, put back on a test at some point. But he was very engaging. And, and of course, Western Civ is a difficult topic because it it's not places as in American history that you even may be familiar with. And, uh, having him for those courses was really uh, a good way to get involved in some aspects of history that I didn't know that much about, uh, but really became more in intrigued with over, over time. Um, as a freshman, I came to Towson as a freshman in 63. Mm -hmm. So I started in, in September of 63 with Dr. Blumberg and others. Of course, that was the year of the President Kennedy's assassination. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, remembering that this year is the 50th anniversary, which makes me feel incredibly old. <laughs> Beyond that, uh -huh. um, I do remember that day. That was an interesting event that occurred. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we all remember where we were when we heard the news. And, and I, the first news was in the student center, not a student union, a snack bar essentially in the basement of Newell uh -huh. was the student center. And there was a television set in one of the rooms, and uh, there was a rumble around. The, this was at 1 o'clock on Friday afternoon. There was a rumble around the student center that something had happened. So people were gathered around the TV. And the first report was, of course, that the president had been shot. Mm -hmm. That was a little after 1.30 or so. My class was 2 o'clock mm -hmm. in Stevens Hall. Uh, all the classes then were in, either in Stevens or Van Bocklin. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Blumberg was the two o'clock professor, the uh, Western Civ professor at that time. Um, my seat was by the window. I can remember that. Mm -hmm. Again, you remember odd things about mm -hmm. education, but you certainly remember that day very, very clearly. And so my seat was by the window. And Dr. Blumberg came in and said, I'm sure you've heard that the president has been shot. There's a report on TV and the radio. Uh, we're going to go ahead with, with the lecture, which he did. And about I want to say 25 after 2, maybe 2.30, he wandered to the, as he lectured, he walked back and right, forth, and right, right. because he'd memorized it all, I really mm -hmm. didn't use notes that I could see, and he wandered to the, to the window, and I could look out the window at the same time, and we both saw the custodian lowering the mm -hmm. flag to, to half step. And I remember the words Dr. Blumberg said, um, the president has died, may God have mercy, on his soul. Wow. And he closed his book and left. So it was a very memorable time, mm. uh, an event mm. uh, pretty early in my career here at Towson that I yes. remember 50 years ago yes. till this very month. Uh, so wow. um, so uh, that uh. Uh, kind of uh, certainly didn't set the stage for my career as an undergraduate here at Towson, but it was certainly an event that I recall. Um, continued yeah. uh, taking um, history courses, I minored in political science, Dr. Coleman was a political science professor that I remember, Michael Grossman was another professor, I think it was here quite a while. Um, my advisor was John McCleary. Now he was an interesting character, he was a specialist in uh, ancient history mm -hmm. and was the tennis coach. 
I didn't know that. So m most of my um, most of my advisory sessions were he would be at the tennis court on this big roller. I guess being a coach <laughs> and a professor, you also had to take care of the court. I in see. Those days. And he would be on this roller, flattening out, I guess, the surface, uh -huh. leveling it in some way. And I would follow along. And he'd look. <laughs> over, what are you going to take? No. Oh yeah, you take that. Take that. And so we had these these ongoing conversations as he rolled around the tennis court. Um, massaging it so that it would be in <laughs> and suitable condition absolutely. for the tennis uh, team to play. Uh -huh. and so he was he was my advisor. He was the uh, he was again a history professor. I see. Um, At what point did you get into any education courses? The education courses came later. Uh -huh. um, but by then you really were enjoying history. I and enjoyed the history courses. I enjoyed the political science courses. Uh -huh. I, I was back and forth between should I major in history, mm -hmm. should I major in political mm -hmm. science. There was a social science major. Mm -hmm. I may have almost qualified for that because I'm not, I can't recall, because I also had several geography courses with Dr. Martin, I believe was a geography professor. Diffendorfer was another. Uh, and uh, oh, yeah. so I had a mixture of social science courses um, but again, it was the intention all along that I would teach. So right. the education courses started, I suspect, in probably the, maybe the sophomore year with an introduction. Dr. Hartley was a professor at that point who, who taught, uh, remember the, the first education course was in the auditorium at Lida Lee Tall, uh -huh. and it was two or three hundred people. Amazing. Introduction to education. And he was also a very engaging lecturer and could handle 200 people mm. in an auditorium type setting and introducing the uh, kind of the history of education and current issues and, and the like. So that was the first one I remember. Uh, I remember more of my graduate education courses than I do the undergraduate mm. courses. Um, by the time student teaching came around, uh, the, the instructor who was my student teaching supervisor from the university was um, named Gehring, Bill Gehring, I'm uh -huh. thinking. Uh, he was a specialist in uh, audiovisual education. Uh -huh. So, Did you go into schools at all before you got to student teaching? No, I don't think so. I don't think in those days you did that. My wow. recollection is that the first time I had gotten back into a school in any formal way was as a student teacher, and that was at the beginning of my senior year. Mm -hmm. So I started te student teaching, I'm thinking, in September and ended in January and then came back for a final semester uh -huh. on campus. I'm pretty sure that's the way that mm. worked. I don't recall going into schools nope. earlier on then. No. I don't believe so. Hmm. So what happens? Do you remember what happened in that student teaching semester? Well, very much so. As I said, it was with a teacher that I had had in junior high school. Uh -huh. He was assigned to me. Obviously, you have no uh -huh. choice in that. It was in, uh, by then he had moved to a school in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, um, Cherry Hill, Curtis Bay area, mm -hmm. uh, school number 239, uh, Benjamin Franklin, at that time, kind of an earlier elementary middle school. We've gone away from those and then we came back to them, but it was a, basically a K to nine school. Really? Uh, that existed in the Brooklyn hmm. area. Um, the, Sections were separate. The middle school, the junior high school was separate from the elementary uh -huh. school, but there was one principal, two assistant principals, mm. one who worked primarily with the elementary and one who worked primarily with the, the uh, junior high. My student teaching was done in basically um, a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, the school had portable buildings I built see. in the war. Uh -huh. And there were several buildings that had connected three or four rooms together. And then there were three single rooms built in the middle of the of the playground of the courtyard <laughs> and the, the critic teacher uh, Jay Riley was his uh -huh. name is still his name and he's still <laughs> the person I met a couple weeks ago again uh -huh. um, he had one of these single room schoolhouses and it basically was the classroom and a small room off the classroom that the reading teacher used for small group instruction interesting so it was one room out in the middle of the playground uh -huh. Of course, every time the kids would come in recess, you'd have all the noise outside the, uh, uh -huh. the, the room. And um, so I remember that very, very clearly. Um, interestingly, and kind of a connected to it, and I, I do a lot of professional development now, and I tell a little bit of my life, you know, uh -huh. people want to know a little bit about you. Of they, course. they don't need to know much, but they need to know a little. And I usually talk about the fact that I remembered going into that classroom and um, 
critic teacher, Jay, had just gotten a new piece of technology. Ooh. This is 1966. So this uh, would be the fall of 66. Uh -huh. And he had no idea what to do with this. And he said, well, you're the hotshot kid from <laughs> Towson. Maybe you know what to do with it. And I usually give the audience a chance to guess what that new piece of technology uh -huh. was in 66. Mm. Would you want to take a guess? In 66? I don't know. Sometimes people will say a mimeograph machine. Well, no, uh, we had no. those. They were the old... Film loops. Uh, no, it wasn't that either, but you're getting close. It wasn't a mimeograph machine. We had those, but you had to crank them, and you get the blue... Yeah, all over you. Yeah. And it wasn't a film loop. It actually was an overhead projector. <gasps> oh. He had just gotten an overhead projector. He had no idea what to do with it. And I had just finished an AV course with, with Dr. Gehring, yes. who was the, the AV specialist, as yes. I said. So I knew, kind of, I guess, what uh -huh. So. I used it in my observations when Dr. Gehring came to see me. <laughs> so I know a little bit of, I knew a little bit about there how you go. what an overhead was for. And of uh -huh. course, there are, uh, the dinosaurs now in classrooms with document cameras and uh. and all kinds of, and, and LCDs and so on. I think uh, overheads are very scarce, but they are. It is uh, an evolution of technology that's a very interesting one, and and that was yes. a, one that I remembered in my very beginning of my uh, uh, student teaching experience at, at two thirty nine. He was someone that you knew well, and probably someone your your um, how do you say it? What's the word for your teacher? Strict oh, they, he's, teacher. He's got a critic teacher. Critic at the time, teacher. Yes. Critic teacher. Um, at what point did you actually start doing some teaching? Well, it was a, a, a an evolutionary process, obviously, uh -huh. within the time there. As with most students' teaching experiences, he would give me the opportunity to lead a drill or to do a discussion or uh -huh. to moderate a small group or whatever we were doing. So it was a slow process over a semester. It was only uh -huh. there one semester. Right. Um, my recollection may not be accurate, but my recollection is that the first part of the semester, I really wasn't even there full time. I'm thinking uh -huh. it was just one day a week for a while. Could be. And then it, it gradually became full time. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the experience, I was taking the full schedule that he had, which at that time was five classes. Wow. Uh, five 50 minute classes. Uh, the school had uh, class sizes then in the lower 40s. Mm. Uh, which was good because they'd actually had class sizes prior to that in the mid 40s. Mm. So there were about 41 or 42 kids in this relatively small one room schoolhouse. So uh, you have over 200 students. We probably did, yeah. We did. Wow. Actually, it, it would be six classes because the, that particular course met four times a week. So uh. there were four times 24 periods. So yeah, it was actually six times 40, whatever that is. That's how many students we had at that time. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a lot of yeah, students. Yeah, a lot of students. And mm -hmm. that class was American history. I'm thinking uh -huh. it was American uh -huh. history. So I student taught that. And it was one of the courses that I taught when I went back to that same school as a, uh -huh. as a teacher the next year. So at the end of your experience, are you thinking this is an okay career choice? Well, you know, I don't know that I ever thought not that. Uh -huh. uh, I had a I thought a very successful student teaching experience. Uh, people, you know, the feedback was good from uh -huh. both, both uh, Jay and, and the university, the college then, uh -huh. the college um, supervisor. So I, I thought it was a good experience. I was enjoying it. I was becoming, I thought, rel I mean, for the being a good a beginning teacher, I uh -huh. thought relatively good at it. Uh -huh. And that was the feedback I got. So I, I just kind of continued along that process. I guess that's what I do. Uh -huh. I guess that's what I do as a teacher. So sure. I applied to uh, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County and Baltimore City. Uh -huh. um, had a pretty good interview, I thought, at Baltimore County. And uh, uh, Anne Arundel County was an odd one. I was called in for an interview talked to the HR guy for uh -huh. a while and eventually said, well, there are no social studies jobs. Too bad you married. Well, now you're coming out in 19... This would be 67? Yes. So he said, there's no, we don't, we're not hiring social studies. Uh, nice and, talk to you, but don't, don't look for anything. And social studies is a very popular program. It was then. I knew it, it still is. still is. I, I know. And so there are fewer opportunities, yeah, you know, fewer so jobs I was kind available. of depressed at that and, you know, not yeah. knowing, you know, kind of, why did it even come down here? Why mm -hmm. did it even call me in? Um, so within a couple of weeks, though, I got um, an advanced contract from Baltimore County. Oh. 
And um, I thought, hey, this is cool. Uh, yeah. I think it, and I think it was the success that I had as a student teacher. Uh -huh. Obviously, they communicated to my re my critic teacher. They communicated to Dr. Gary and here, and uh, offered me an advanced contract. The advanced contract did not indicate a school. Uh huh. I didn't know anything about Baltimore County. I was a city kid. I went right. to school in the city. I student taught in the city. I really only applied to Baltimore County because I thought, well, I should at least open my options. So I called the supervisor of social studies who had also observed me as a student teacher in the city in the city and said you know i got a contract uh from baltimore county and a bird in hand is you yes. know the rest of that yeah. and she said well we want to hire you for baltimore city as a matter of fact there's an opening in the school where you student taught <laughs> a, st a teacher is going on maternity ah. and she's taking a couple of years off and uh i can offer you that job i said well if you can do that, I need to get back to Baltimore County within a, a few days. If you can get something to me in writing, I would be pleased to go back to that school. Uh -huh. So that's what I did. She did that, and I, I went back as a teacher in the very school where I had student taught. Mm. And as I said earlier, my critic teacher by that point had become the department chair. Yes. She was my boss again. Uh huh. Wonderful. And you probably had some of the same students, or at least saw some of the same I students. I saw some of them, yeah. They were eighth graders, and my, my time as a teacher in the school, I had all three grades over the time I was there for five and a half years, so I, I taught all three grades. Uh, we were on shifts for part of the time. Oh, my heavens. Uh, the school was so crowded, uh, I, and I would usually opt, if I could, if I had a choice, for the later shift. Uh, one time, my day would start at 10.30, I would monitor lunch, I had lunch duty. Half the school was on a regular, I guess, 8 to 2.30 shift, and the other group was, was a later shift. So I would monitor the lunch for the earlier shift, and then start my classes at noon, and teach through to 4. Mm -hmm. So my breaks mm -hmm. were at the beginning of my time, uh -huh. and then the classes all were back to back right. for, for four hours or so. And that was a comfortable fit I like that you? because at about 2.30, a lot of the school emptied, and I only see. had the seventh graders who were in the later shift mm -hmm. in the building, which mm -hmm. made it a, a quieter building. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't mind you know, because I, lived, I still lived in South Baltimore, so uh -huh. it was relatively close. I didn't have a long drive home. And I, I liked the late shifts. At least two of the five years, I was on the, the later shift. And then eventually, uh, the elementary school moved out. Oh. And it became only a junior high. And that's when uh, we were able to go away from the shifts because we had more rooms. Right. And, so. and at some point, you become the department chair? Yes, I did. Actually, in five and a half years. I was told I was the youngest social studies department chair that they had <laughs> ever had. I don't uh -huh. know. Sure not. Not in that school. I, I actually uh, opened uh, what is come and gone as a city school, Greenspring uh, Junior High School uh -huh. at Cold Spring and Greenspring. Uh, so I was the first social studies department chair there. And we started uh, that year, uh, the, the, the first portion of that time, we were at the Old Western downtown. And then the school opened, so I was part of opening that building uh, and was there one year and decided that I really wanted to look at a different experience. Uh, I then went back to Baltimore County and applied again uh -huh. as a department chair, hoping to become a department chair in Baltimore County. Uh -huh. uh, said, you know, I, I was really mixed, had mixed feelings about leaving the city. Of course. Again, they had been very kind to me in terms of promotion. I was also writing curriculum for them. Mm. And I, my supervisor at that point was Dr. Samuel Banks, a well-known and pretty controversial person in Baltimore City Schools over the years. He was a social studies supervisor the last year that I was there huh. as the department chair. And he had hired me to write curriculum for a couple of summers, so I knew him well. And I felt really guilty about that, uh, about going to Baltimore County. But the city experience was not one that I was wanted to to spend the rest of my career in. Uh -huh. It's a difficult school, sure. a difficult situation. Um, when I went back to Baltimore County and, and was re-interviewed after the, these six years, uh, you know, I said that to the person in Baltimore County, I'm really feeling bad about this because they've been very kind to me. And he said, well, you know, five and a half to six years is about average. We get a lot of city teachers uh -huh. that come to Baltimore County after that right. because they, they kind of see where their career could be going and, uh -huh. and what probably that's the future is for them and they decide they want a different experience mm -hmm. so and i actually went back to, to dr banks that was uh they had hired me to write curriculum that summer and i said you know i'm leaving 
uh -huh. going to Baltimore County, uh -huh. and I understand if you would want someone else to write curriculum right. for some of them. You said, no, we didn't hire you for what you're going to do. We hired you for what you know yeah. and what you've done. Wonderful. So I still want you to write curriculum uh -huh. for someone. So I, I couldn't have, he couldn't have been nicer. Uh, it just was a, well, so it was a, it was a mixed feeling for me. You know, of I, course. I had lots of, uh, my whole experience had been in city schools. Uh -huh. And to, to leave them was, was difficult. Mm -hmm. But again, I looked at where I wanted to kind of looking over the long haul and deciding perhaps the county would be a better experience. So you've got, you go from being a department chair in a brand new school mm -hmm. in Baltimore City and what do you well, fall teacher, into? I was a teacher in Bal Pikesville okay. uh, Junior High School also. Mm -hmm. um, interesting experience there because I thought of myself as a pretty hot shot teacher and the, among the few I mean, hot shot teachers that I experienced and I went to Pikesville and everybody's a hot shot <laughs> and it was a very powerful department there. Uh -huh. I think every one of us have end, ended up in some administrative capacity uh -huh. either as a supervisor of social studies or as an assistant principal or principal in my case eventually uh -huh. as an assistant superintendent and uh, it was everybody was good so it really did cause you to take your profession to the next level because uh -huh. you couldn't sit on your laurels at all. Right. Uh, everybody, we were doing all kinds you of creative things. You were all at the things. same level. Yeah, and, and everybody and pushing, pushing. Uh -huh. it was a relatively young faculty. Most of them were around my age or a year or two younger. Uh -huh. And the school had been open about five or six years and they had been, they lived through that and I came in kind of at the end of the opening phase, but as the school was really kicking off and uh, it was a great four years there as well. Um, as I said, we all ended up in some way, I think, in uh, my department chair there became the associate superintendent of schools in Baltimore County. There well, you go. Many of us, all of us uh -huh. ended up in, in leadership positions. Uh -huh. It was a, a, a really great time. It was the first experience I had with open space. Uh -huh. uh, I was in a room that the walls closed or open, oh. which was great because yes. you do both. I had uh -huh. my class, but uh -huh. we would have uh, the, my colleagues and the other three Yes. Parts of the room would open up and we'd do learning stations and we'd do uh, grouping with a, a seminar group up here and learning stations and la a laboratory pa uh, learning activity packets. We had lots of innovative things going on that I'd never seen in Baltimore City. Well, you, but you did put that open space concept into, pl into we play. We did because we had the opportunity to, to do both, to close yes. the walls. And even though there was a little bit of a noise spillover, it wasn't, it wasn't too much. You could actually, and we needed both. The uh -huh. kids needed the opportunity just to be with their teacher. Yes. And they also needed the opportunity to interact with the other four, the other three classes. Uh -huh. And we used both. And uh, my, a couple of my colleagues, again, and my, my, the colleague I remember the most uh, became a superintendent in, in Pennsylvania school. So uh -huh. it was just a high-flying group. Uh -huh. So I went kind of from a really neat experience to even a neater experience right. in that school. And, and very different. And different. Different community, different expectations for parents, mm -hmm. a very engaged parent community. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, was, it was a really neat time. And uh, I did lots of school events there. I was a student council advisor. I did all those kinds of things uh -huh. that social studies teachers do. Mm -hmm. Now, did you take on any leadership positions in that? school i uh, not in uh, other than a student council advisor right. or things like that uh, right. i was then um actually had a great experience after that um i uh, i've written curriculum both as i mentioned for the city but then also for baltimore county uh -huh. and i really got into that i really liked that experience and in that time baltimore county curriculum projects were huge there would be several hundred people hired to write curriculum in, and we'd all come together in one place usually pine grove middle school other Lock Raven and other places, and for two or three weeks, sometimes the whole summer, you would write the programs that would end up as the curriculum used by the entire district. Mm -hmm. And um, that I really engaged. I really love that. Uh, and so I got the opportunity to do it. I think the first summer, because of what I had done in the city, right. the first summer in Baltimore County, I did that for the four years that I was there uh, in social studies at Pikesville, and it was really a neat experience that I'll come back to also because that kind of came around again in my life in uh -huh. a real positive way a little bit later. But I had the opportunity after four years at Pikesville to apply to be the project director of a grant. And the grant was called the Police Student Relations Project. So this is the 70s now. Uh -huh. It's hard to imagine with school resource officers and the uh, um, 
extent to which police are actively engaged in schools now, uh -huh. that was not done in the 70s. No, not at all. There was a real hatred of many middle school kids to police officers. Mm -hmm. So the idea of this project that had started in Montgomery County, and Baltimore County was the second county nationally to do it, was to have police officers interact with school kids in middle school, uh -huh. but it wouldn't be a one shot come in, talk to them, it would right. be the basis of a curriculum. Ah. So we wrote uh, in, uh, units that became infused in, in uh, science, social studies, and English, in police work in lots of ways, uh, writing police reports, or the crime lab was oh. a science unit, or uh, police uh, rights and, and so on, and, and interacting with Miranda warnings and things like that for social studies. We wrote curriculum. It was piloted first in three schools, then in 10. It became countywide in Baltimore County hmm. in the late 70s. And I directed that project for three years. Uh -huh. So it really capitalized on a couple of things that I really liked. I liked the curriculum uh -huh. writing piece. So I was the director and, and chairing these. And I would bring teachers in who worked for me in writing these, uh, these units. And um, it also kept me in touch with middle schools so because I was, I was going out to schools and spending all my time in schools, helping the teachers teach the units, arranging in the key piece of each unit was a visit, at least one visit, from a police officer. Uh -huh. Not the officer friendly whose job right, it is. Right. These were precinct police officers. Uh -huh. So we made the connections with the local precincts. And these were people who were on the street that the kids saw. Right. And the idea was to have an, a non-adversarial interaction uh -huh. in the classroom uh -huh. over substantive police issues and to build that relationship that uh, would mean that when they interacted outside of school, the dynamic of that interaction would be different. Right. And it, as I said, it started with three, went to 10, eventually went to every middle school in Baltimore County uh -huh. and became the beginning of the, uh, the, deer, the, uh, the, deer, the deer project. Uh -huh. The, uh, uh, no, is, is, I'm blanking on that. And deer is drop everything and read. So it wasn't deer. It was dare. 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 The police, in a, a similar project. Dare, yes, the dare project, and, uh, uh, which became well known across the country. Yes. So this was um, the, the predecessor of that in Baltimore County, and the first time that police officers actively became involved in middle schools. And eventually, now, as we know, we have school resource officers who spend their whole days. Mm -hmm. interacting in mm -hmm. both positive and, and negative ways with, with kids in school. So that was a wonderful experience. And again, having the curriculum writing experience was really neat and being able to do that in middle schools was, was also really fun. And how nice to be in on something at the beginning. Absolutely. And I it mean, was, really as with any it. projects, the beginning is always tough and you go through a lot of, yes. a lot of wonder, is this really going to work? And what can we do to improve this so that it would be teachers would feel comfortable with it? Because that was our first audience. Right. The teachers. Would the teachers want the police officers? Uh -huh. and, and what would the police officers say? Because this was not uh -huh. a trained, you know, this, the, the, the police department had trained people who interacted with the public. That's not who we brought in. Uh -huh. We brought in mm. uh, the street officers. Yeah. The crime lab guy. Yeah. Uh, the detective who, the homicide detective. Yeah. And so... You know, never really knew what they were going to say. <laughs> because, you know, they didn't really. They, I don't, they were not trained to interact with people, so that so it was interesting. Sometimes you're sitting like, you really said that, you know. And we are actually, actually, the first couple of female officers oh. in Baltimore County in the '70s, we nice. used them as well as role models. So we were trying to show career development too. We developed uh, the predecessor of uh, videos, which were uh, uh, slide tape presentations. And so we had a photographer who worked for me, and we went out and, and took slides of police work, developed a script, and I narrated them, or the police officer would narrate them, and this, the teacher would use that in, kind of as, in the instructional sure. phase prior to or after uh, the police officer would right. come in. So it, was, it actually captured a lot of the things I was really was interested in. So I was really blessed to have that opportunity to do that. But that something, a, something takes you away from that. Well, it's a three-year grant. That's I what see. took me away okay. from that. The money ran out. Uh -huh. and, well, uh, that's, that will do it. That will do it. So I was uh, reassigned as a, as a teacher. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I taught at Dumbarton Middle for one year. Back to social studies. Uh -huh. Same thing that I had taught before. Again, another high-flying department. Uh 
uh-huh. um, and then was promoted in Baltimore County to department chair. So I'm uh-huh. kind of where I was a couple of years before that in the right. city at Old Court Middle School. Mm-hmm. So I was department chair in social studies at Old Court Middle for four years. And uh, again, really exciting experience, w- wonderful people, great opportunities. I continued to curric- do curriculum writing in the summer and uh, enjoyed that as well. Then, uh, it feels like I, I can't hold a job, right? I'm feeling through <laughs> this and thinking, can he hold a job? I'm not no, sure. No, it's opportunities present themselves. And you got it, exactly. So um, a job opened up in central office, and it was a, by an odd title. It was called Curriculum Consultant. Okay. And, but it was not, consultant sounds like somebody who doesn't work for the district, but this was a, a full-time position in Baltimore County Schools, uh-huh. and my role was the head curriculum development. Like, wow, uh-huh. my dream job. Uh-huh. Uh, now, w- w- what was that job already there? It, it, was, a, it was a position. It was. Someone had worked on, with it. I had known her in the time I wrote curriculum. Uh-huh. She was the supervisor of the process. Uh-huh. Above the, I worked for, for a social studies supervisor, but she was the person above that person in the, in the development phase of curriculum. And I applied thinking, well, you know, this is what I want to do. Let's see what happens. And I was just so shocked when I got a call from Dr. Mary Ellen Satterley, who was like a legend in Baltimore County uh-huh. curriculum, saying, we're, we're presenting your name to the board tonight as the curriculum consultant. We wanted you to know. So we'll let you know. I'll call you back and uh-huh. see if it goes through. And it did. So uh, I was able to have what then I thought was my dream job, uh-huh. heading curriculum development in the 26th 26th largest school system in the country is pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And um, so I was in charge of all of those five or 600 people writing curriculum in the summer, and I shepherded each of those projects. So we'd have about 30 or 40 projects going in all of Baltimore County's curriculum writing at a time, shepherding all those. I was the final sign off on curriculum development. So every curriculum guide that Baltimore County issued I would have to read. <laughs> Excuse me. I, it was a, it, not at all a lot, but uh, really, oh. the, I learned a lot because I I read curriculum from things I had no idea mm. about the subject. Mm-hmm. But I would read it as that's maybe that's a good thing. If this made yes. sense to me, uh, it, I guess it made sense to the physics teachers or yes. to the uh, uh, trig teachers or to the home home economics teachers that I I didn't. It, it's a and, and so I was the sign off. And uh-huh. these were pre word processing days. So any mistakes that I saw, I, we, they would either, secretaries would either have to type over with some kind of a correction tape, mm-hmm. white out, retype the paper, which meant I had to read it again mm-hmm. because there could have been mistakes that were made the second time that weren't made the first time. It was an involved process. Involved mm-hmm. process. But my dream job. Mm-hmm. Interesting, I mentioned getting my master's here at Towson. Yes. And, um, I don't know if I did mention that, but I did you, I yes. went back as a, in the 70s. Went into my, back to my first school, went into my principal at that time, said, I'm a master's from Towson. Uh-huh. And he said, you're going to go ahead to get your doctorate, aren't you? I said, absolutely not. Uh-huh. I am done with education. Uh-huh. I have finally got a little money. I've been teaching a couple of years. I never had any money before. I got a little money. I'm no, done. I've been going to school my whole life. This was in the 70s. So now we fast forward. This was in the early 70s. Now we fast forward to the late 80s, 15 years later, uh-huh. I have this dream job. So I go yes. to state meetings, people who develop curriculum uh-huh. meet every couple months around the state. And I was the new person, so everybody introduced themselves. You're Dr. So-and-so, you're Dr. So-and-so, you're Dr. So-and-so, you're Dr. So-and-so. I'm Mr. Thomas. Mm. Looks like this, would, this is my dream job now. Uh-huh. I don't have a good history of staying with jobs very long. Uh-huh. I guess it looks like I got to get my doctorate. Mm-hmm. Everybody else in the room seems to have their doctorate. Yes. So I went back at, to College Park then and, and worked in curriculum theory and curriculum development with my doctorate there. So I, uh, the principal who said that funeral was a couple of years ago, and I attended the funeral, and I wrote to his daughter and gave her that story about oh. how if I'd only listened to your father and gone back and got my doctorate when I was in my 20s, it yes. would have been a lot easier than it was when I was in my 40s because mm. the old brain cells were not as swift as they were in then. But I, 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 while I was working in curriculum development and having, I had a, a couple of other odd 
promotions over time, eventually uh -huh. became the assistant to the associate superintendent of curriculum uh -huh. and instruction in Baltimore County. Um, I was in the doctoral program at the I same see. time. And the real blessing at that time, Baltimore County, was that I was able to get a sabbatical to finish. Yes. So the year that I finished, um, which was in the early 90s, 91, uh -huh. um, within one year, I had unfortunately had, had to take, all, I had put off all my stat courses. Actually, I started one, no, maybe I started two and dropped out. I never dropped mm -hmm. out of a course in my life, but working, reading all that yes. curriculum, trying to do all that stuff, and take stat was just too much. And so I would start driving down to College Park, yep. getting out of class at quarter to 10, mm -hmm. got to be at meetings tomorrow at 7.30. Mm -hmm. uh, I dropped out of stat twice. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't taken any of my stat courses. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple other courses that the committees suggested uh -huh. that I needed to take for my dissertation because I was at the dissertation phase by then. So I had to take four stack courses, the these few other courses, within the year, I conceptualized my study, got it approved, did my study, wrote my dissertation, and uh, took these other courses that they told me to take within the year of my sabbatical. So my friends at- You were busy. My, my friends in Baltimore County, the late Ron Koontz, who was also at his doctor from College Park, said, you're gonna love it. You'll go down to College Park, you'll lay on the grass, you'll watch the co-eds, it'll be wonderful. <laughs> Hey, that wasn't my life. My life was 18 hours a day trying uh -huh. to get this thing done because uh -huh. I knew once I went back to work, it's too many ABDs yes. that, that were in a program, go back to work, and were not finished. Yeah. I was, again, fortunate enough to be able to go back, and I was out off one year, July to July, I went back July 1, and handed in my, my final version of my dissertation August 15th. Mm. So I was that close. Defended wow. in September and ended it. That was the yeah. end of my doctoral work. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was a, it, having that year was the only way I think I could have finished. Probably. I don't know that I would have finished mm -hmm. otherwise. But mm -hmm. it was a 18-hour year. I mean, I was trucking down to College Park three or four days uh, a yes. week. And again, this is kind of pre-computer time. So uh -huh. there's a lot of handwork, a lot uh -huh. of tallying things, a lot of visit. Does it? My study was a qualitative study involved interviewing and uh -huh. observing classes. So it was a lot of time spent in it. Fortunately, it was all Baltimore County schools, so I knew the territory. I knew many of the administrators yes. from the jobs that I had had. And so it was a, I was able to smooth some of the wrinkles out. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, went to, I, I obviously had to get your, the dissertation approved from the director of research. It was mm -hmm. George Gabriel at the time. And I went in and said, well, here's the things I want to do in my dissertation. The committee has loved this. I'm going to do this and this and this and this. I think you got three dissertations there. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do this much and stop. So, oh, they're never buying that. So I said, okay, yeah, cool. Let's, so I went back, had another committee uh -huh. meeting and said, well, I met with so-and-so and so-and-so and, so, and this is where we're going to end the dissertation. And they agreed to it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, cool. Uh -huh. And, and uh, Steve Selden was my advisor. And in a few cases later on in some of the meetings where the committee would tend to uh, go off in other directions. Well, you know, you could, you uh, could, you could. And Steve was very good about saying, well, that'll be Dr. Thomas's postdoctoral. There you go. So he, he put the box around it and said, this mm -hmm. is what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. This is a good dissertation. And, uh, and so I was able to finish that way. So you go back to work on back July to work, 1. Only a couple of weeks actually in Baltimore County after my my sabbatical oh. because I had heard about a position in St. Mary's County of associate superintendent. Mm. Um, the superintendent was previously in Baltimore County. Her name was Joan Kozlowski. She was mm -hmm. a principal in Baltimore County. I don't believe she has a Towson connection, but I'm going to see her Sunday at, at the dinner. Well, I'll ask her because uh -huh. we still connect and we get, still get together in ways that we never could have gotten as employee employer, frankly. Yes. Because it's a different relationship. Of she course. was my boss. It was a whole of different course. relationship than now. But um, she was also a great mentor. And in my leadership classes, I, I asked them the first day of class, describe a leadership hero for you. Uh -huh. And let's talk about why that person was a hero. And I want to model what I ask students to do. So I talk about Dr. Kozlowski as my leadership hero. Uh -huh. And she was my superintendent when I was the associate superintendent in St. Mary's. Um, I think the people in St. Mary's thought we kind of came as a unit 
she got the job and then she hired me. I see. We did not really, I knew her of her in Baltimore County. We had done, she was a big county, you know, we had done some things together, but not really closely. Uh-huh. She knew of my work, but not, we didn't right. come as a unit. Sometimes superintendents uh -huh. bring along well, with do. them people. And while I think that's, that was a perception in St. Mary's, that was not the case. But uh, I was four years as, as the associate superintendent of instruction in St. Mary's County while she was superintendent, the four years of her superintendency. And what do you do as an asso associate superintendent? Well, I was in charge of the total structure. instructional program. There were Whoa. two, there were two assist, there was an assistant and an associate. I was the associate. Uh -huh. The assistant uh, fortunately did all the things that I didn't like to do. Uh -huh. So he was in charge of uh, business and, uh, and transportation mm -hmm. and food services and personnel. And I had all the rest of the operation. So it was all the, all the principals reported mm -hmm. to me. There were 24 schools at that point in St. Mary's County. And all of the central supervisory instructional staff, which was, I think, around 25 folks, uh, all of those reported to me. So I was, I was supervising the big, basically going from a, a, a small fish in a bigger pond to a bigger fish in a smaller pond and had the total responsibility. In Baltimore County, I was just responsible for curriculum development, mm -hmm. and then other people picked it up after that. Uh -huh. Now I'm responsible for the total package. And that was the time of the state testing program, beginning with functional tests and then evolving into um, MISPAP, the Maryland School Performance Assessment Program, uh, which kind of connected to later on and things that I did later on in life. But I headed that implementation in St. Mary's County. Moved to St. Mary's County. My wife uh, ended, retired as a teacher after 25 years in Baltimore County. We had met at Pikesville mm -hmm. and married and then she we spent one more year here, so we transitioned down there, bought a home, uh -huh. thought that would be where we'd spend time. Right. But, you know, my history is not good at keeping <laughs> jobs, as I mentioned earlier. So um, in four years, my uh, superintendent uh, said she was not going to actually decline. She had been reappointed and then declined. Oh. Very unusual in the superintendent, the way superintendents work. The yes. boards actually reappointed her, and then she said, no, I'm not going to continue. She wanted to have that reappointment as opposed to I'm leaving, uh -huh. making it seem as if uh -huh. there was some problem. There were yes. not. She was, again, so, so far ahead of the rest of us. That's why I really call her a hero. She, she was, this was in the 80s, and she was talking about assessment and talking about data, talking about improvement in ways that most of us couldn't understand. Uh -huh. She was reading Peter Senge. She was reading people that I now use in my grad courses, but I hadn't read those folks then. I didn't know what a learning organization was. What do you mean a learning organization? We teach. Don't we? I mean, we, he, she was so far ahead of the rest of us. And so my job as, as the associate uh, was to try to translate her ideas to the principals and to the supervisor, uh -huh. trying to figure out what exactly she want us to do? Where does she <laughs> want this system to go? Um, and so that's what I became known as kind of the, the the implementer of Dr. Kozlowski's ideas, uh -huh. and um, her just was so so far ahead of the rest of us in thinking. And I, I say, she knew what was around the corner before the rest of us even knew the corner was coming up. Mm. Just that she is so much a leadership hero for me, um, and um, so that was a great experience and um, one that again I value. Each each piece of my career has been. Just unique to me. I, I'm saying unique to me, but also I've been. I, I can say that I grew from it. I think and enjoyed it. I don't remember ever not liking mm. what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have, everybody has good days and bad days. Well, sure. But overall, I I was I had the next flexibility, I guess, to be able to move on if I didn't really. Yes. But I really none of my moves were really because I didn't like what I was doing. Uh huh. It was I don't because I saw other opportunities. I kind of get bored. Uh, I think the first year in any job, you learn the job. The second yes. year, you begin to make some changes. The third year is a year of real change where you put your uh -huh. imprint on things. Uh -huh. After you do that one more year, it's kind of like, okay, I think I've done my work here. Yes, or and maybe you've given it every good idea you have. You have, exactly. We all run out of ideas. Yeah. Exactly the reason. And so it's, it's time to look elsewhere. And uh, at that time, I had um, really liked the urban area better. St. Mary's was of culture shock in some ways it was very rural yes um i was a how much can a super, superintendent be a celebrity but you, i was well known uh -huh. and so everywhere i went uh -huh. 
people connected you with the school. That was not, not that was usually, that was never happening in Baltimore County, which is a larger county. I, I, I will cite one example. We were church shopping, uh -huh. my wife and I. Uh, so we decided to go to this Methodist church in, um, in Leonardtown. So we attended and we kind of sat in the back and the sermon was all about how this hour of worship is so different. You put away the cares of the world and we focus on better things. We focus on God. We focus on how we should be kind to our neighbor. We focus on these things. It was a wonderful sermon. The way it, the custom of that church was the sermon ended, they sang a hymn and the service was over. Uh -huh. So we did that, we march out. One of the first people to shake the hands of the pastor and he says, aren't you Dr. Thomas? Uh -huh. um, I have a problem with my child. I don't think she's getting the advanced tr programming she should be getting. What, what are we doing for gifted and gounded kids in, in St. Mary's County? I, said, I thought, wait a minute. Didn't you just, I didn't say this. I did write in my letter. Oh, you did. Later on, but uh -huh. I'm thinking, didn't we just say that this hour was supposed to be uh -huh. one in which we put all that aside? And within three minutes, you're raising that issue to me as I'm shaking your hand as a potential church member? I guess the hour was over. I, I didn't join that church. <laughs> we went to another church eventually. We didn't join oh that one. Oh my. So I, I didn't, I wasn't altogether comfortable with that. Every place I, you know, you're standing uh -huh. in line getting salad in the, didn't have giants in St. Mary's County, in the salad bar, the local uh -huh. store, and somebody, oh, anyway, what's happening? Uh -huh. I, wanted, I wanted to uh, perhaps <laughs> uh, get in a different situation. And so, again, uh, things really work well that, uh, I had the chance to come back to Baltimore County one uh -huh. more time uh -huh. as a assistant superintendent in charge of educational accountability. Oh, okay. So this is a new title and a new responsibility yes. for mm. you. Yes, it was. Um, there was only one other person in the state that had that title. Oh. Hi, I'm, I'm assistant superintendent for educational accountability. I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. right. Accountability <laughs> was not not as clearly defined thing. This was now, now we're talking mid-90s, uh -huh. so we're talking almost 20 years ago. Uh -huh. uh, again, in the middle of the MISPAP time period. Yes. Uh, lots of concerns, particularly in Baltimore County. Baltimore County was a hotbed of, of concerns about, um, about MISPAP. And so my job was to direct that process of gathering data, uh -huh. to direct the process of, of, of writing and implementing school improvement plans, and of um, using the data in a way that is positive and productive. And that kind of directed the rest of my career has been in that area of, of working with teams and working with school schools to use data in ways that I think the, the way the data should be used. And unfortunately, not in, in the ways that I see in many cases data being used in schools. Well, and so was this a new, were these new concepts for you or things that you, that you knew about but you really hadn't been so intimately involved in? I think they were concepts that Dr. Kozlowski kind of laid the groundwork for. I see. Because again, she was using this terminology. She was talking uh -huh. about these things as the rest of us were saying. What, what does that what mean? What does that mean to me? What does that mean? What do I do differently? Uh -huh. if, if I'm data driven, what's, what's that mean? Uh -huh. I, I give tests, don't I? Uh -huh. and, and so it was a whole different view of, of, of how do you move beyond the score? Right. I, I, uh, I give tests and, and, and these number of kids got A's and these number of kids got B's. What, what else do you need from me? Well, yes. that's just the beginning. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, even today, now we're talking almost 20 years later, that's the view of some today still. And uh -huh. unfortunately, I, I think it's what I'll call, I'll call the first generation data people, uh -huh. leaders, first uh -huh. generation data leaders uh -huh. like me. And in many cases, we, we, missed, uh, we missed the ball game. We messed up. And we messed up because we didn't have the training in data analysis that I think leaders have today, or uh -huh. some of them do. And we use data to basically, to, I, I'd use the expression, hit teachers over the head with it. Mm and didn't really understand how data can be used in a positive way to improve what you do uh -huh. and to get better at what you do. Uh -huh. And when we get better at what we do, the kids' achievement increases. And my goodness, the test scores go up. Uh -huh. What? And, and that concept, which seems to be so obvious now, yes, uh, still is not a concept that a, a lot of people, or some people at least, haven't internalized. So that was the beginning of that, those concepts in, in Baltimore County 
and in working with uh, schools to try to, to do that in a way that would be well received by teachers. And that they, because frankly, unless the teachers receive the, the message, it doesn't happen. Right. It, 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 in some situations, the teachers will sm smile and nod, uh -huh. and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go back to the room and do what they were doing anyway. Uh -huh. um, in other cases, it's just hostility. Well, and, I, and I think we brought it on ourselves in a lot of ways. I, I, I think that that is the way first generation data leaders uh -huh. like myself uh -huh. uh, have presented it, which is why I'm, when I teach graduate courses now at Towson in, in those areas, I am thrilled because I think the second generation data leaders, the people uh -huh. that are in our graduate programs here at Towson now, uh -huh. will see data in a different way. And well, maybe it, it had something to do with, didn't you say there was the word accountability in your right. title? It was. And, and that's and a scary it is. word. Absolutely. So, so I differentiate now really early on between uh, accountability, which, which I've named, I, I think I, it's from me, although I probably, I wouldn't bet that I didn't hear it someplace else, but I've kind of adopted it and, and claim that it's mine. Data to prove is accountability data. And that's the data that the public sees. That's mm -hmm. the data that is in the paper. That's the data that resulted in AYP. Mm -hmm. And that's the data that will be used for the new park assessments. Data to prove. That's the test score, basically. How many, it's, it's a how many question. Mm -hmm. How many passed? Mm -hmm. How many scored above the cut score? Mm -hmm. How many, I differentiate between data to prove and what I think is the much more important type of data, data to improve. Mm -hmm. And that's instructional decision-making data. Mm -hmm. So you go below the score. What did the students do well in? Mm -hmm. what, what pieces of this assessment can you celebrate? Can you build on? Can you go back to your class tomorrow and say, we were talking to the teachers yesterday about your latest test and boy, we were so pleased that you did well in. Mm -hmm. That's really cool, guys. You really got, who, what can you go back and tell them? Okay. And who, who, who can you really single out as doing very well mm -hmm. and have that little, really cool, really get, well, keep that up. So we have that conversation first. We always mm -hmm. start with the positives. What are the, what are the things that you can celebrate from your class? Mm -hmm. Okay, now we move to the needs. Mm -hmm. What in that assessment did the students not do well? So it causes mm -hmm. teachers to unpack the assessment, mm -hmm. unpack the skills and knowledge that are embedded in every assessment we give, and identify what pieces of that need more work. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about a process to decisions that teachers need to make as part of a process to address the areas of need. It's a whole different conversation than why didn't your kids pass? It's Absolutely. all about what you can do, what you need to do right now or in the future. So we're not talking about changing next year. Uh, a, a teacher just asked me that the other day as I was doing some consulting in the school. You mean the data now we're going to change? No, we're going to change it tomorrow mm -hmm. because we've just revealed an issue that your kids need some work on. And, and you, I didn't tell you. You told me. We looked at the data. You mm -hmm. identified it. Now we need to talk about what's that response going to be. Mm -hmm. Is this important enough that every kid needs to know it and they need to know it now? And if that's the case, then let's plan that lesson that you teach tomorrow. Let's mm -hmm. plan the lesson right now. Is it something that you can embed in next, the next unit? Okay, let's talk about how you're going to embed it. How does it fit? Intentionally reteaching, but not a, a standalone stop and right. teach today. Right. And then we look at a lot of other possibilities and we we kind of go through the pluses and minuses and we end up as what's the response of the team going to be? Um, how are we going to do that collaboratively? And um, then uh, hopefully they go back and do that. And, and then, then I meet with them <laughs> in a couple of weeks later and uh -huh. how did it go? Uh -huh. And this is all part of a data analysis process that a colleague here at, and I had developed uh -huh. uh, called the CFIP. Uh, Mike Hickey and I developed the Classroom Focus Improvement Process, which is a data protocol. Mm -hmm. And it helps teachers have the difficult conversations that they might not have without having a protocol. And that's really where I spend a lot of my time now. I, I retired in, from the school district in Baltimore County in 2001 as the assistant superintendent and um, have flunked retirement since then <laughs> because I'm here full time. Teaching. When did when did that happen? So that you were in two thousand one. So you were in, but this sounded this sounded like a very good fit for you. It was a perfect fit um, in Baltimore County. It that was. this really tapped into what you enjoyed doing and what you were good at. Mm -hmm. 
And again, it was four years, five years into the position, uh -huh. and I thought this might be the time. A new superintendent is a good time, too. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Harrison came. I worked with him for a while, and, uh -huh. and this, I thought this may be the best time to... I had 32 years in the school district, mm -hmm. in school districts around the state. Uh -huh. Fortunately, it's a consistent uh, retirement program, mm -hmm. taking it from Baltimore City to... Interesting. I did not join the Baltimore City Retirement Plan the first year because I thought I'd never stay in the business long enough to retire. <laughs> then they made you join it in the second year. Uh -huh. So I had to actually teach an extra year at the end. Yes. You, you can't make up that. You know, no. You can make it up, but you make it up at your current salaries. Nobody does that. Right. So I, I, I think it was 32 or 33 years within the retirement system, 34 in public education. So that's enough. So when did you con reconnect with Towson? Reconnected with Towson then. Uh, I you decided, hadn't taught any... I, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, no. Thank you for mentioning that. No, I was an adjunct for about 15 years. Ah. In the time when I was director of curriculum development, I started that actually at uh, what was then Western Maryland College. Mm -hmm. And almost every year for 15 years, uh, I was an adjunct, either at Western Maryland and then eventually here uh -huh. with the, the MAT program. So I would teach either a summer course. I, I was always working full time all summer, but I would teach a summer afternoon or evening course, uh -huh. and then eventually courses during the semester in the evening uh -huh. for the usually the part time MAT students, and uh, a longer time actually <clears throat> at Western Maryland um, for ten or fifteen years. When I even moved to St. Mary's County, I thought, oh, that favorite time of. You know, I would tell my students in my classes, this is my favorite three hours of the week, and they kind of roll their eyes like, yeah. <laughs> and I, my, my smart aleck comment after that was, well, you know what the rest of my week is like now. This is my favorite three hours. And it was really. The, the time I was teaching as an adjunct was my best time of the year, week. <clears throat> and um, so um, when I uh, went to St. Mary's County, I thought that would end, but it turned out McDaniel, I guess it was still Western Maryland then, had started a cohort in Southern Maryland. Mm -hmm. This is cool. I mm -hmm. can continue to teach the same courses mm -hmm. I was teaching on campus. Now I was teaching yep. them in, in Southern Maryland. So I had Calvert and St. Mary's and Charles County teachers. We'd come together at Charles County board and I taught the same courses. I came back to Baltimore and then started teaching again as, as an adjunct here at Towson. So I had that experience. I had about 15 years of, of again, positive uh, evaluations and student responses and all that. The dean was Dennis Hinkle then, who was uh -huh. very kind to me. At, at first I said, uh, I'd like to, to come back at a certain date, then kind of got uh, uh, a little bit of vamping from the superintendent. Oh no, you need to stay, you need to stay. Yeah. And so, okay, Dr. Hinkle, I'm really not gonna come. Then I decided, no, I do need to move on. And to go back to Dennis and say, you know, remember, I kind of turned you down a, once, can uh -huh. I kind of come back? I understand if I can. I, I, no, no, start right away. I started, I ended in Baltimore County in 1st of January and started here in the February semester. Wow. And so what position here did you come to? I'm still a lecturer. Uh -huh. I probably have the long, I don't know if this is something to brag about or not. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Prophet said I was the first or second longest holding lecturer in the College of Ed. Uh -huh. I guess I'm not supposed to brag about that. But Why not? actually what I wanted to Why do, not? I'm not in tenure track. I, I obviously was not going to go into tenure track at that time of my career. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a lecturer, I've been a lecturer, but also have the opportunity to be the associate director of the Center for Leadership in Education. Uh -huh. with, again, my colleague, Mike Hickey. And tell us about that center. It's really the outreach piece of the what became known as the ILPD, Instructional Leadership Professional Development Department. Uh -huh. uh, we started with a series of summer seminars. We called them assistant principal seminars, eventually instructional leadership seminars. Mm -hmm. And we asked districts to send us your next group of, of folks who are just on the cusp of being principals. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the job, maybe, many of them got the job where they were in the seminar. Mm -hmm. We'd have celebrations because boards <laughs> would be meeting in the summer and five or six of our 30 or 40 people just got promoted. Uh -huh. Really neat. And they were first time principals. Uh -huh. So send us your folks that are ready to be principals. And, and let's share what we think need, they need to do when they get in their schools. And so we had a week or two of, of concentrated work with them, continued uh, to interact and coach them throughout the year, had follow-up sessions where they'd come back uh, and we would have uh, sessions during the year. And that was our first experience in outreach uh -huh. to, to, the, uh, to the profession. And um, we ran those for about eight or nine years, I guess. Um, as with everything, things kind of have a of shelf life. Uh, 
Sure. And at some point, uh, either we had trained all the aspiring principals or districts ran out of money uh -huh. or something happened. We uh -huh. kind of, we lost uh, some traction and we haven't done those for a couple of years. But we've kind of re, we've, we've rethought the way we interact and, and certainly those are possible. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, uh, our connection with the Baltimore Hebrew Institute here at Towson, uh, two summers ago through um, the connections that we have with them, we, we did an instructional leadership Institute for Jewish Educators, uh -huh. uh, and uh, it was through Hannah Bohr, uh -huh. who is a professor in the, from the Baltimore Hebrew Institute, and she, her great connections in the Jewish schools in Baltimore. We had about 35 Jewish educators, and um, the, the, the non-Jewish comp comp component, it was really, a, you know, uh, all along we're thinking, well, really, what will, we can't help these Jewish educators, can we? And Hannah would say, no, they've had enough Jewish education, uh -huh. what they need is instructional leadership. Uh -huh. They need to understand instruction. And, and that's the same in the public school or in the Jewish school. Uh -huh. And it was, again, a great experience getting to know a whole group of about 35 Jewish educators that we've continued to work with. And, and hopefully we'll have another opportunity this coming summer because the plans are to, to have that institute again, kind of a level two uh -huh. for folks who were here before and level one for some new folks as well. So uh, Hannah Vohr is another valued friend here on the faculty that has been very, very helpful to spread the word about the work we do. Uh -huh. But we've continued those, but more like more as well, we have also do a lot more face-to-face, in-school consulting during the school year, uh -huh. particularly around data, <clears throat> particularly around the use of the classroom focused improvement process. Uh -huh. And so I spend uh, two or three days a week full-time in schools. Uh, right now we work primarily in, uh, in Howard, and, and Harford counties, uh -huh. Prince George's County. I was in a Prince George's County school yesterday working with their math team in a turnaround school, very challenging school mm -hmm. in, in the Suitland area, of Prince George's County. Uh, we work in, in many Howard County schools. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, tomorrow I'll be at, a, at a, school in Howard, a middle school in Howard County all day. So I basically work with their teams in the course of the day. Mm -hmm. So at nine o'clock I see the eighth grade team at, 9.30 or 10.30, we see the seventh grade team, that kind of day. So they have the opportunity to hear about this data protocol, to practice it, because I go back to the school multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a long-term commitment with Sandy Plains Elementary School now in Baltimore County, mm -hmm. where I'm there every two weeks. Hi, come back. <laughs> so much of PD is one shot, and we yes. know that that is not effective. It just doesn't work. So the only way that PD is going to have an impact is ongoing coaching and mentoring, uh -huh. and that's what I do. Uh -huh. And and I can absolutely see the difference in terms of the way teachers are, because we start with their views of data, their perceptions of data, and now all the way to the very definitive protocol and how do you use that and where do you go next and how do you integrate the protocol with your collaborative planning. It's the evolution is is really neat to see, and the as teachers kind of a value the time that they didn't value before, that they feel this is a good use of my time. Uh -huh. I get something out of this that I can use and, and I see the difference in the learning of my kids. And once they see that, you got them. That's the, that's the hook mm -hmm. that really makes the difference. So that's what I do. Uh, I teach full time, graduate classes and leadership, school curriculum, database decision making, classroom assessments. It, Issues of some interest right now. Uh huh. Enormous. In, it, yeah, interest. absolutely. Uh, Common Core park assessments, teacher principal evaluation systems. It is huge right now. So this is a great time to be uh, involved in these things and to work with teachers as they kind of come to grips with all of these changes, and to help them do that in a positive way. Well, and that's wonderful because that word accountability is has sort of reared its head again with the same kind of terror that was associated with it oh, in earlier it, it times. It absolutely is. And now, so, uh, since it's connected to teacher evaluations, mm -hmm. it's another whole dynamic. And I talk about paradigm shifts occurring. And this big, I think, is the major paradigm shift right now, two components of it. One was the, the shift in the in Maryland, I think, in the 90s, certainly in the rest of the country with No Child Left Behind, I call it the shift from teaching to learning. Mm -hmm. It's not about the teaching anymore. You know, I was observed a uh, hundred times, I mm -hmm. guess, as a teacher. I'm embarrassed to say this. 
I don't ever remember anyone asking me about the student learning. No. It was all about me. Right. What did I do? Well, you did this well, you did this well. Here, you could have done that differently. Here's something that you really need to work on. It's all about me. Uh huh. And now, the first question that teachers and observers ask in any teaching observation situation is, what did the students learn and how did you know? Uh -huh. Whole different dynamic of conversation. Now, all of that relates to what you did as a teacher to enable them to learn, but the focus of the conversation is on student learning. And I think that's a paradigm shift. And then the second paradigm shift that I, that I talk about and I make presentations on and I do keynotes all over on is uh, the shift I'll call from, from some to all. Mm. You know, in, in the bell curve world, mm -hmm. it was okay to have a group up, only a small group up here at the top, most of us right in the middle, and then that small group at the bottom, hey, that's life, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. That's not the expectation today. It's every student achieving. And, and we first started by saying every child can achieve. And the verbiage has switched, and it's switched in the last couple of years in a very powerful way, I think. The terminology used now is it's not every child can succeed, it's every child will succeed. And that has dramatically changed the expectation mm -hmm. of everyone concerning what happens in classrooms. It's now the onus of the teacher to do what it takes to enable every child to succeed. If we said every child can succeed, we always could say, well, yeah, they can succeed if they do their homework if they come from a supportive family, if they don't watch TV or play video games, if they behave themselves. They can succeed if they did all those things. Now we say every child will succeed, meaning the teacher must do what it takes to enable that child to succeed. It's a whole different dynamic. Indeed. So that's what I spend my time doing now. <laughs> all of this is at um, the in-service level graduate in service, mm -hmm. maybe not if you're involved in MAT, that's initial search. Yes, it is. Um, I guess my question to you, and this was this is just really gross out of my own curiosity, is are is what you're doing being approached at the initial cert level as well? It's a really concern that I have that it's not, in my view. Um, I think that uh, there's a, certainly an interest in these topics. Uh, obviously our Dean has made it really clear, as he should have, that these are, these are concepts that need to be embedded in every place, of the, every point of the program, in-service, uh, pre-service, post-graduate, so on. I wonder how much that's happening. I'm concerned that there's not specific courses that undergraduate students take in assessment or data. Mm -hmm. They can't go to a school meeting for 10 minutes without hearing about data. Mm -hmm. Yet, we don't teach an undergraduate course in data analysis. And until this year, our graduate students who got a master's degree in, in our program in instructional leadership only took data analysis if they chose to as an elective. Mm -hmm. This past September, through the work of, of Diane Wood, our chair, it's now a required course, mm -hmm. but that's just now. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in our program, even if they started before this past September, they could take it. Yeah, if it fits in, you take it. If not, you don't need to. Mm -hmm. Now they have to. Mm -hmm. But th that's not true in undergraduate, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. There's no data analysis course. There's no class. And I'm not talking about, uh, and I think the attraction of the kind of work I've done is, is we, we don't talk about sophisticated statistical analyses. Remember, I'm, I dropped out of stack <laughs> twice. I, it went in one ear and out the other. It's all about instruction. Uh -huh. And, and in, I say whether you're a statistical or a, a statistical nerd or a, a wonk, uh -huh. you can do data analysis. Because uh -huh. it's not about the numbers, it's all about instruction. Uh -huh. And that's what our pre-service teachers should be engaged in. Uh -huh. And they need to know about classroom assessments, how to develop tests how to develop performance tests that are going to look like the park assessments. To my knowledge, that is not part of the program. Uh, Ron, for our audience, would you mention a little bit about those park assessments, what that is? Park assessments are, are the, the new assessments that are being developed to assess the Common Core State Standards. This year, uh, this is the third year of transitioning into the Common Core. Mm -hmm. uh, two years ago was what the state called an awareness year. 
Last year was called a transition year, and this year is called an implementation year, meaning that if a teacher is teaching English language arts or mathematics in any school in the state, they should be teaching from the new set of standards this year. Mm -hmm. um, the implementation has been rocky. It's happening in some places. It's not happening in others. There's all kinds of controversial issues about why that's not happening. Each system has a little different story on that. Uh, and I hear that every day when mm -hmm. I'm in schools. I hear where that system is, what's good about it, what frustrations that teachers are having. Um, but it beco be is becoming the national curriculum. 46 states have adopted it and the District of Columbia. Uh, so it will become close to a mm -hmm. national set of standards. Now it's called a curriculum, but it really isn't a curriculum. I directed curriculum in two school districts. It's a set of expectations. It's a set of outcomes. It's a set of what students should know and be able to do. It's not a curriculum. It mm -hmm. doesn't te tell the teachers how to teach it. Mm -hmm. But there's another component, which is the park assessments. And the park assessments are, again, national efforts. There, there are two competing groups developing national assessments now. One is called the Smarter Balance Consortium, uh, which sounds like the name of a margarine, but it's really not. It's a consortium <laughs> of states and PARC, a Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Career, that's what the acronym stands for, about uh, 20 school, uh, states are part of the PARC uh, model, and they're developing uh, an assessment, a new type of assessment. Uh, MSA, the Assessment for No Child Left Behind, was predominantly multiple choice with uh, short answer questions that became known as Brief Constructive Responses, BCRs. BCRs in schools took on a life of their own and became a fixation in a lot of schools. Two or three sentences, formulaic, this is what you write. Respond, do this, do this, this, you get the points. Park assessments are different. There will be some multiple choice components, but the park assessments are set up as what are close to performance tasks, meaning that in most cases, they're authentic. They put students in authentic situations. Hopefully situations that are great, appropriate, not always, uh, but they could be authentic for an adult, but we're still asking a seventh grader to, <clears throat> you're, you're going to build a fence around your house kind of thing. I don't think a seventh grader is building a fence, but maybe an adult is. So they're that kind of performance, authentic task. They uh, are interdisciplinary. So there's writing involved, which has been under uh, emphasized in the last couple of years, except writing these formulaic PCRs but actual extended writing uh, or evidence-based, meaning that it's, it's not just a matter of telling you what and my student, as a student telling you as a teacher what I think, it's telling you what the text says and citing evidence from the text that supports what I just say the, the text says. Right. Um, so these tasks are uh, authentic, they're real life, they're based on real life, they involve uh, evidence citing, they are interdisciplinary, somewhat like Ms. Pat was in the past, but not the same. Again, I, I like metaphors, and I think that I would compare, you know, people talk about the pendulum swing in education. I think right. that's the faulty metaphor. A better metaphor is a, a, a tire going down the road. Hmm. Yes, the same spot in the tire comes around again, but it comes around at a different point in the road. Hmm. So performance assessments are coming back. But they're not going to look like MSA. I'm sorry, not like look like MSPAP. They're going to look different. Another piece of the park assessments is technology. They're all going to be delivered via computers. It's a big issue mm -hmm. of capacity in schools mm -hmm. to have the actual number of machines and the bandwidth that they need to, to test eventually every child. So there's lots of issues, but they're the park assessments. And, and we will not have a national assessment uh, because, as I said, there are two consortia, and states can adopt fully one consortia, do a little bit of one and a little bit of another, or still write their own state test, or, right. may, and, or a little bit of all three. So I think the goal was at some point to have a national assessment, but the way it's playing out, we may have close to a national curriculum, but nothing like a... We, we'll still have the discrepancies in states, that sure. right now was part of the impetus for starting part, because mm -hmm. the idea was that it, it, 
if you're proficient you, you, in this, a seventh grade reading, you should be proficient in seventh grade reading, whether you're in Delaware, Maryland, Massachusetts, or Mississippi. And that was not the case under current, is, is not the case under current state assessments. Right. So um, the idea was to move away from that and having a consistent cut score. Well, all of that will occur, but every state will not use the same assessment. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be the national assessment that perhaps people wanted or thought mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. But there will be some, there some will, there, there will choices. Be, there will be choices and there will be um, assessments that are of the type I described that, that really hopefully will engage students more. Right. That will engage them in a cooperative venture sometime. That was the other piece of MISPAP that was lost in MSA. Uh, you could go into a, 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 a again, as when I directed this in, in Baltimore County and in St. Mary's, you could go into a, a, a class where the kids were talking to each other and they're giving the, te the test. What do you mean they're talking, giving the test? Well, this was work that they were doing preliminarily. Yes, they did eventually sit down and themselves did the test, but this was cooperative learning to lead up to that, to engage more, to get them involved in the task, that eventually, yeah, they did have to sit down and uh, they did get a score that was unique to Ron or Karen, but uh, the earlier parts of that, the setup of that was collaborative. So. Right. There may be pieces of that in part we, I think we, we wait to see. Mm -hmm. Part uh, is gradually putting out sample items and as soon as they come on the website, schools grab, grab them I'm up. I'm sure. Trying to, what, is, what, is, what are the expectations here? How are the expectations different here than, than they were in MSA? What do we have right. to do now to prepare kids for part when that rolls out in two years? And who's developing that? assessment? They're being developed through the consortia of these states that basically uh, they're state testing experts. Mm -hmm. They also have really big impact, uh, big influence rather, from testing companies. Mm. Uh, they were they were basically the companies that developed MSA tests, the same companies, the, the Pearsons, the, with the Stanford and the uh, Riverside and the other big testing companies are helping these consortia. Sure. They have the expertise. Mm -hmm. They do. So um, some people see that as a plus, some people see that as a negative, that it's again the same same old, same old crowd. Um, but they, you know, the, the timeline was short, three years to put together national assessments, to put together a national curriculum. The money runs out next June. Mm -hmm. We'll see where we go from there. Hmm. Ron, what have we forgotten? What about I think I've talked well longer than I said I was going to speak. I think we've said it all, unless you have something else that you want to ask. I think I've, I have said everything I need to say at this point. There is one final question we ask everybody, and that question is, what wisdom would you share with an individual who is considering a career in teaching? Well, I would say absolutely learn as much about it before you make the commitment. As I said, I don't recall having the opportunity to actually go, in, go into classrooms prior to my student teaching. And then it was kind of too late. Mm -hmm. I was in the senior year, you know, kind of in, in it. And I know that's not the case now. I know that students have many, many opportunities throughout their college career before they begin even to have to say, yes, I'm going to be an education major, or at the very beginning of the process. So take advantage of all of those. Mm -hmm. Find out what's happening. Interact with teachers. Interact with a, a range of teachers. Uh, advice I always give the new teachers is select your friends carefully. You can select a group of very negative people mm -hmm. that are not going to be very happy. And you're not going to be a happy person if that's the group you fall into. Mm -hmm. So as a student, you're not sure what you need to talk to lots of people, some of whom will be very negative and may advise you not to do it. Mm -hmm. Others of whom will say, it's, it is very challenging. I work very hard. I don't know a good teacher that does not say that. Mm -hmm. I said that umpteen years ago, and I, and I still work very hard. I, I believe at what I do. So it's not a matter of not wanting to work hard. And teachers, good teachers will say that, but they'll say, I work hard, but I'm very gratified by what I do. I love working with the kids. I love seeing their progress. I love writing curriculum. I love doing all the stuff that I did, as I mentioned in my career. Um, that they should know as much about that as they can before they make the decision. And as with, I think, in my day, I suspect that once you got into a profession, you kind of stayed in. Mm -hmm. I don't know that people in my age change a lot. That's not true today as we know. Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't really like to see the turnover that I see. It, mm -hmm. It's a real revolving door. Unfortunately, it's a revolving door in the most needy schools. Yes. And that's very distressing. So know what you're getting into. Talk to a variety of, of teachers. Talk to principals. They're going to be your boss. Find out what their expectations are of new teachers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think we would neglect that. I can't talk to them. I, I can talk to the Yeah, no, seek it out. Mm -hmm. Talk to principals um, and, and find out what exactly happens here. What do I do? Mm -hmm. What do you expect me to do? You know, and, and learn as much about that as you can. If you end up teaching, you don't have to be a permanent career. But go into it thinking that you're going to spend some time in this. Don't go into it thinking, well, I'll just do it for a year and I'll, like it, I'll get out. That's not going to be, make you a very happy teacher. And the kids pick up on that. They do pick up on that very quick. Uh, I think that, if anything, I've been, I'm known and still known uh, uh -huh. through the courses I teach here as a hardworking teacher who really does, at least for the moment, try to convince my students that whatever it is we're working on, it's the most important thing in the world. You need to know it right now. Now, they know that's not true. <laughs> I know that's not true. But if, if I can convince them of that, at uh -huh. least for a short period of time, then I've engaged them, and they're going to learn it, and they're going to walk away thinking, well, that was a good use of my time in that class. And uh -huh. I think I try to do that in my classes here at Towson still today, and people say that. Even on my online work, and I, we have completely course, we have a complete program online. Even the online classes, uh, great comment at the end is, we feel we really know you mm -hmm. because of the videos I do, because uh -huh. I'm... I, I'm, I'm all over that site all the time, uh -huh. and I speak in the first person, and I share them in writing, fortunately, the same things I would share face-to-face. -face. Right. So I think they get to know me as a person, uh -huh. um, and that's important to, to any learner. Uh -huh. So know, know that the students are going to know you, and, uh -huh. and be, be ready for that, and, uh -huh. and uh, be open to that. Again, they don't need to know everything. Right. They need to know a little bit. Uh -huh. They need a little bit, and they need to be able to relate to the little bit that they know. Uh, it, it, it's a tough job right now, uh -huh. and I, like anything, I think we will learn from it. We'll get better at it. When we get better at it, it won't seem to be as intimidating as it is now. But new curriculum, new assessments, new evaluation systems, all coming at the same time, Whew. is really stressful. Mm -hmm. um, know that that those things will pl play out in whatever mm -hmm. way they plan out. We don't. I don't know how they're going to play out. But whatever way they plan out, they play out. It would, it will mean over time, people will become accustomed to it. It'll mm -hmm. just be the way it is. Mm -hmm. It's the way we do things around. Mm -hmm. here. Right now, it's not, and so it's traumatic. But eventually, it's the way we do things, and people will accept it and go to the next level. And I think each one of these examples move move education, move learning uh -huh. to the next level, and uh -huh. that's what I think we all do. Try to try to, in any job you have, I think you try to, well, and I. I, I really tell the folks who graduate from our leadership program, the minute you get your first job, as an AP usually, uh -huh. do a survey of the school, walk around, and very intentionally look at instruction, see where the teachers are, see what's happening, write it down. Uh -huh. You gotta forget it. Uh -huh. Don't go back in the next week because it hasn't changed. Uh -huh. In a year, uh -huh. in two years, do the same thing. Walk around again. Look at instruction, drop into classrooms, see how the cafeteria operates, all the stuff that you were involved with. And if you see that things are at a different level, that's your work. Uh -huh. That was you uh -huh. that did that. Celebrate that and you'll feel good about what you do uh -huh. and be ready to take on the next, the next challenge that you have. It's been a good career for you? Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. My pleasure.